The claim that international organizations are bound by IHL has been controversial. In order to give a brief overview of this controversy, let's keep to the example of the UN. Remember, this question only arises for those missions where the UN exercises operational and strategic command over the armed forces. Otherwise, it is the members that are bound by and liable for failures to comply with IHL. The UN, which was the first international organization to undertake military operations, was initially reluctant to have its forces bound by IHL. The reason stated for this position was that the UN did not want to be considered a party to the conflicts it sought to alleviate. Remember that it is participation in a conflict that triggers the application of IHL. The UN argued that accepting the application of IHL, thus implicitly becoming a party to the conflict, would undermine its neutrality and put the mission at risk. However, in reality, UN forces, even peacekeepers, might have been interventionist and partisan to one side in the conflict, despite being presented as neutral forces. The UN also argued that it could not accede to IHL treaties, since these treaties were only open to signature by states. Lastly, the UN also emphasized that some provision of IHL treaties were not adapted to international organizations and could then never be respected by them. One example is the obligation for state to prosecute those suspected of having committed serious IHL violations. The UN has no capacity in order to fulfill such obligations. However, the UN has softened its stance and is now no, no willing to accept the obligations of IHL. This process began with the UN making ad hoc declarations in which it recognized that its forces had to respect the spirit and the principles of the main IHL treaties in relation to specific missions. After that, similar commitments were made in ad hoc agreements concluded between the UN and the troop contributing states and later between the UN and the host states. But again, this has only provided an ad hoc basis and was limited to the principles and spirits of the main IHL treaties. A further step was taken with the adoption of the Convention on the Safety of United Nations and Associated Personnel in 1994. The Convention aims at protecting the members of the UN operations, including by criminalizing some conducts affecting them, such as murder. Article 2, which defines the scope of application of the Convention, expressly excludes from that scope, and I quote Article 2, any United Nations operation authorized by the Security Council as an enforcement action under Chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations in which any of the personnel are engaged as combatants against organized armed forces and to which the law of international armed conflict applies. So these provisions makes it clear that the UN forces, those authorized by the UN Security Council to carry enforcement actions, might be bound by IHL whenever they were party to an armed conflict. This is the first time that this was admitted in general terms. It was only in 1999 that the UN gave a clear endorsement of the binding nature of IHL on its forces. In August 1999, the UN Secretary General issued a bulletin entitled The Observance by United Nations Forces of International Humanitarian Law. More precisely, this recognizes the applicability not of all IHL provisions, but of the fundamental principles and rules of international humanitarian law to the UN forces. It contains a list of IHL provisions, which are largely inspired 
from the provisions applicable in international armed conflicts. It is expressly provided that the, that the list is not exhaustive. It goes beyond what it is provided under customary IHL and sometimes even beyond some, some IHL conventional rules, for example, by providing a general prohibition on incendiary weapons. Those rules are applicable to UN forces, and I quote the built-in, in situations of armed conflict, they are actively engaged therein as combatants to the extent and for the duration of their engagement. They are accordingly applicable in enforcement actions or in peacekeeping operations when the use of force is permitted in self-defense. What therefore matters is that UN forces are actively engaged in the combat. Again, this must be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis and in light of the facts on the ground. For example, even if a UN force is presented as a peacekeeping force, and therefore as neutral, it might be possible that, given some specific circumstances, it took part in combat, and therefore the UN built-in is applicable 